That's a good one. It's not the first one to mention project management. That's I want to start off by saying that we're going to be covering product management, not project. And while project cover deliveries, planning, and resources, product we try to look at prioritization and make sure that what you're building is the best we can deliver at a given time. So just a bit initial disclaimer. We can have one next question and then we get started. Are you too shy to join us? So what is your interest on this panel here? Uh, I do have a request from a friend. He's looking for a technique leader, but not only about technical solutions. He wants someone doing the technical part and be an influencer for the team. But then what's your interest on this panel here? We have a, this request? Okay. So that's also interesting input because some people just want to spend some good time together and are interested in how we make Blender. And in that sense, this is going to be one of those moments. But we won't be talking about Blender specific features. In a way, we might not even talk in that much about Blender. We are all here to hear and to learn. I have three fantastic guests with me today. So we can all grab a microphone yeah. and we can get started. So from there to here, that's Emilio Coppola from Godot. Hello. Foundation, not for the Blender, uh, the Game hey. Engine open source. It's a bit of echo. Yes. Yeah. Okay. There's still echo? Uh, I think in this one, I kind of like hear the one, like half a second from somewhere else. All right. Good thing we haven't started rolling yet. <laughs> hello, hello. Echo, echo. 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 Yeah, I, I think it's fine. But, yeah, I uh, think this one's okay. Uh, yeah, this one maybe it's a bit too loud, the or the maybe you're just too loud. someone is <laughs> maybe I'm too loud. It's the mic number one. So before if it helps, we're going to introduce them and then they can talk and then we can start this conversation. We have here Hans Hurwitz from Canonical, known for you know their flagship product, which is the Ubuntu. Yep. So thanks very much for coming here. Andy Gonzalez, Andy from Penpot. Pempot is this open source to the online vector application. We do use it at Blender for some mockups and wireframes. Um, we had originally also invited Ana Cerejo. She's a designer at Canonical, leading the open design call. Something Hans is going to be able to share about, which is about how do you bring design and design process in open source? How can you onboard designers? How you can make the community also to participate on the design decisions. So she, unfortunately she couldn't make it, but thankfully Hans could fill it in, but it's gonna be recorded. And you're gonna hear more from that. So, and I'm, I'm Dalai, I'm here on uh, behalf of the Blender organization. I worked as a product manager for the team. And when we had the topic of this year, which is making Blender, Tom, brought it up that I'll be very nice to not only talking about development, but to start talking about those other topics which are tangent to making the software the software. Then the four years had a strong um, product presence from in the, in the figure of Tom himself. He's a product at heart and designer. And now we're transitioning to find ways to scale that. How can we make sure we become a product culture? How can we make sure that engineers don't take over the world? And it can find a good balance. So I'm going to be here more like hosting. We have a few topics we know. I uh, want to bring it up. Everyone, please, you're welcome to add to any conversation. So maybe as a starter, you can like talk a bit about yourself, but a little bit for you, your organization. How do you see the role of product and how important it is, or where does it belong, uh, Emilio? As a starter. Yeah. Well, for us, we, we never had a person or a team focus on product so it's always a bit difficult to figure out who is in charge of what and you know there's a lot of people with very strong opinions uh, and the biggest challenge here is that we cannot do everything ourselves because we're a very small team so we need to capture that help from the community and translate it to something that's actionable for us to do and um, I feel like that's one of the biggest things that uh, we always try to involve the community in, but also guide a little bit because there's a lot of needs and a lot of people want to do something different with the software. 
but you need to find something that will benefit the majority of users. How much of the design, the new feature contributions come from the main roadmap established by the Godot core team? Now how much is someone send a PR pull request? Okay, now that's in the agenda. Let's look at that. I, I would say it's mostly from people sending PRs and uh, in particular is when they have something like they need and there's many people that also need it as well, then it's very evident that that's something we have to do. But we don't have a public roadmap that we say these are the features we want or these are the next things that are we going to come. And that sometimes is good, but also bad. We're gonna be publishing one soon with you know, questioning everybody on every area, like what are the things they would like to be uh, seeing in their areas improved but the community already submitted so many different features or proposals that our work is mostly trying to filter them out. And there's no concern on you going to into many different directions and not prioritizing one group or another group? Well, it's a lot based on the bus factor that the area has. Some areas have no, no, not a lot of contributions, so they are a little bit abandoned and some others are very, very active. And um, yeah, it, it is, it is also based on the needs that they will have at the moment. So recently we had a huge switch in terms of like what our main user was. Generally before it was mostly indie developers, now there's bigger studios. So we start to see some other new needs appear. And it's always us trying to keep it good for general purpose game development, game development specific, and the changes that can benefit everybody, not only studios or not only small teams. So it's hard and we are still trying to find ways of making this less of a chaos that I feel it is usually in this sort of community driven open source project. Uh, but yeah. For a bit of a change, because Penpot is a project that is started as a internal jam a project, a designer, a developer sitting together. You guys had their need yourself to use some tools. Uh, yeah, um, it's working. Yeah, it's working super well. Okay. That was my first question. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Benford was the product of a project that emerges, uh, emerges in one of our weekly innovative, uh, yeah, with one of our uh, innovation weeks. Two each year, and we do like a lot of crazy projects. Most of them just end up there. Yeah, and then it became now it's a tool that everyone can use, and right. you became a sub company from out of the main Kaleidoscope yeah. hub. Yeah. Now I see I follow the Penpot development. They are open source, and they, you can follow every single epic, every single. I think it's been tested, anybody report, but you still have most of the, all the roadmap is fully, mostly centralized. Yeah. Yeah, how does it work? Because it looks weird, right? From, a, from the outside. It looks anti-open source, but then looks very design centric. So yeah. Maybe it's a balance there. Well, uh, I think you have your point there. Um, yeah, uh, our roadmap is public. Uh, we have um, our, yeah, our roadmap and two which is a tool that, that we already built, that we also built. So Tag is the, what we use in Git in Blender, just is a forge, yeah. like GitLab, like GitHub. Yeah, and Tag is a much older project than Pendle. So we've been using Tag like for a long time, like before Pendle. And we love Tag, and we use it for, for, for a lot of different projects because we were a consultancy agency before becoming a product company. And I think we started using Taiga in Penpot maybe because just in inertia, right? We were already doing that and we used GitHub to start the, the source code and that was fine for us. But at some point, um, the, 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 the repository in GitHub started having some, uh, some activity. We started having some pull requests from people. We started having issues. Uh, bugs, enhancement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Was the repository in GitHub only a mirror or the main development was being hosted on GitHub? 
The main development, development was hosted. In, it's just that for the, bug, yeah. track, bug reports, we're using the internal tools, tag in yeah, that case. Yeah, okay. when we were using internal tools, right. But then we, we realized that the community was in GitHub, yeah? And that we didn't want to break that. But we also didn't want to break our you know, product development process. That was mainly based in terms of um, uh, tracking the, the work uh, was, was done in Taiga basically. And it looks like um, um, suboptimal first, what, suboptimal, okay. yeah, it's a way to say that yes, but duplicating word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's company language, right? And, but at some point, we realized that this helped us to maintain a relationship with the community while, my, while being able to keep our product vision. So if I have to summarize, I could say that GitHub is at the place, one of the places in which we have um, a conversation, an active conversation with the community. But at some point, we need to ensure that our product vision is being, is being put, put, in fr put in front of what the, the, our user base asks. We just, just not do what they ask us for, to do, right? We, we develop the things that we believe that are aligned with our product vision and that we believe that are going to deliver more user value, right? And these double places to work on help us to, to, to think each time that we have a user request, okay, is this going to help us in our product vision or not? And it helps us to do some sort of creation, right? And to, to have this product-centric development. Maybe just uh, bring up to the, I, when I saw this at first, I found it very different than what we do at Blender. At Blender, we have this one place where the whole development happens, where anyone that has an issue can just go and report it. That was a problem at some point because Blender has 30 bugs reported every day. And usually that could bring, uh, could, you know, takes uh, developers attention every day throughout the whole day if you don't if you're not careful about it so what we have to do is to make sure we solve that by process so the bugs get in they're only seen by the triaging team that's part of the community that's also part of the core team there are two to three people full-time hired only to handle triaging and the moment a bug is confirmed they get a little tag oh this is a modeling bug and then the modeling developers can look at that or a bother to get a ping and know what to look at. But some people did consider having a development, like a first place to report bugs in the forum, for example. But we, the main decision point was it's better to have every, to get the user base closer to where the development is because it's easier for someone to report a bug, but also to see a patch and help testing that patch and giving feedback on a patch or whatnot. But that's but now that I think of it a bit more, at Blender we do have the separation between what happens online and honestly what happens in the headquarters. And it's a, it's a problem we try to be self-conscious about. We have a lot of core developers who are in the payroll, are essential to the, to the team, who are remote. And having their remote is an asset that, that makes sure of the whole communication we have is always synced with everyone. So the moment we, we worry about people who are online, we make sure it's and visible for everyone. But I honestly, if you're honest about that, we do have a, the place where you keep a lot of the core vision and thinking about uh, design and product. A lot of this happens in the headquarters. Not everything, but in, indeed a lot. And it's just some nodding heads from people from the community heads. Hans, I, in my mind, cannot and on Ubuntu are interchangeable. I know that's not the case, but it's, you know where that comes from. That's common. Um, yeah, well, let me introduce Canonical briefly. Um, so Ubuntu is basically half of our efforts. Um, we've been building it for 20 years. It's made of hundreds of packages that are mostly developed by other people. So I think that we have about 600 engineers that work on Ubuntu and 10,000 contributors for any given six month cycle. Sorry, 600 oh, contributors from the community. And no, 600 uh, engineers in the company. <laughs> and 600 engineers. And yes, 
and 10,000 engineers contributing every six months, um, like actively, and then another 100,000 that are like building the packages that we depend on. So it's a big project. Um, the, our company is um, about 1,200 people right now, I think, and we have only 30 product managers. But I would say that we, like when we, right now, we're having an event we call our pop-up headquarters because we're a remote first company, by the way. And like it, there's some value in having people together in one place to make these key decisions. So we do that on purpose twice a year. When we do that, the parts of that where we just talk about product issues is 300 people, even though there's only 30 people who are called product. So in some ways, the core of what the company does is obviously like building secure software, having a good engineering practices, but very closely after that is product definition and making sure that like you can actually build a product over 20 years that continues to be something that adds value to the world. I think here, I think Canonical is probably the one that has the most traditional role of product and product managers hired. It's also a role which is kind of dying in the industry. There's a few articles elsewhere saying, hey, product management is dead. Because it got bloated. If you go to the Bay Area, you met VP of product, senior product lead, technical product lead, product for assets. I've been in those meetings and it's, it's a bit scary. And sometimes there is a product person with two engineers only in their team, very strange ratios. Um, one thing I wonder, because in a traditional company, a product manager would represent a group of users, a user base. And on the open, in the open source world, the process is so transparent that the developers are very approachable and the users are also very transparent about their needs. They're very vocal about it and very passionate about it. And I still always wonder if the role of the mid middleman, middle person, is really needed, or is there's anything to leverage on that? How do you guys do that? I would say it's deeply needed because we have, I mean, a lot of our users are also contributors, and that gives them a sense of kind of privilege that they feel like they should be able to kind of push the product the way they want to, um, even if they're one of 10,000 people. Um, there's also, like, we have paying customers. I mean, we're a business, and so we are... Um, even though we make an effort to make sure that the value we're generating, a minority of that is actually being paid for. We're trying to be Robin Hood and make sure that big companies are paying for open source, but the rest of the world is benefiting more than they are. Um, despite that, you then have that open source world of people using, the wor world of people contributing, and the world of paying customers. And a product manager has to balance all yeah, three of those. Listen. So who pays the bills get to have the louder voice? It's, it's really not true, but it's really hard to prevent that from being true. Like that's an active effort to make sure that the money doesn't um, control the influence. And the relation you have is really customer's product. Not in the case of Blender, we have donations. And there's a very clear line that if you're donating, you're supporting the project as it is, but you're not paying for a specific development. Tax alone, this is entire different revenue, right? For paying for, for software. Um, I know Canonical in the past, in the recent past, uh, used to have like work groups to talk about design. Try to do, not design by committee, but try to empower um, new subsides of the community to, to add to it. And how does that, how do you guys do it nowadays? I think a lot of that changed. Uh, not too much. Um, well, so I, um, I should set context. I'm the head of design, so I'm not in product myself, um, but am definitely my team is part of that efforts of 300 people working on product. Um, we, you know, I have a lot of people who do design as people would think of it, like they're doing wireframes and interaction patterns and making sure that everything is attractive and that people have good experiences, etc. cetera. Um, but we also need to tie together the 90 products that make up the company and make sure that we benefit from our scale, that we're good partners to everyone else. And so I have three working groups that try to tie everything together across the company. Um, the one that's most interesting here, I think, is the open design group, which is to say, like their mandate is to try to figure out how to take the sauce of what we do internally as a corporate design team with people whose full-time job is to design products and make that collaborative, make it so that 
the, the things that we build as a team and the processes that we learn are shared with the world and that we get contributions not just from developers but also from designers or um, let's say wannabe designers that, um, that have ideas that we can't just throw away. We have to figure out how to bring those in. Do you also have your engineers contributing with design? Yeah, absolutely. So that's, um, I mean, the first step towards doing that well is to engage the engineers within the company. So like we can't very well say, oh, well, you can contribute to our products um, in a design sense. You don't have to just give us code, but only if you're a designer. Like we, we can't do that. Like everybody is a designer in that world. And that includes engineers both outside and inside. How is this, how is the open design initiative working so far? Um, so far it's been, um, it's been slow because there's so many different opinions, um, in the community and we're trying to basically build opinions on how to do or what, to, what to build on, on how to do, um, there's like, I, you know, I don't want to trash my own people, but I, I don't mean my, it's gonna be I don't recorded. mean my team. I right. Um, I don't want to trash my own industry, but the design world is full of people who kind of like really feel like they're like, because they're a designer, their opinion is going to be stronger by default. And they're not ready to actually describe, well, this is why I have this opinion. And this is the standard that we're trying to meet. And um, so we have to do things like one of my favorite tricks is to make sure we have a conversation about how we define good separate from the conversation about whether something is good. And that just getting people on the same page with that, that you can't just go and file an issue on any given project and just start spouting your opinion that that's not valuable, like kind of build up a community of designers that kind of become our ambassadors take some time because we're frankly, design is far less mature than engineering at open collaboration. Yeah. On our side, we really see that how we structure everything from the beginning was from developers to developers. So it's always very scary for designers to get involved or for people that are more interested in product to get involved because you don't know how to navigate something like GitHub, everything is very confusing if you never used it before. So we're trying now to do a little bit more into being in different areas where people can have this sort of feedback and trying to aggregate that feedback that usually we missed because they were not filed in an issue or something like that. But it's a bit challenging because when we start doing that, then we find that people already have reported that sort of need. and We noticed that we were duplicating a lot of work. So what we try to do now is try to filter better like the feedback we already got and try to see different indicators of features that are very needed and how we can get them uh, included. Okay. Um, how, how do you prioritize in that case? In that case, there's a lot of things like if there's a lot of conversation in one area that we see it popping up many times, let's say somebody reports something and then we see it's a duplicate or something that somebody else, we close that one, but you know, you keep the track of this many people already try to complain about this particular area. And then also in terms of like reactions, like thumbs up on the proposal, people making videos about it or plugins that are very popular in a particular area. And we see like, maybe this is something that should be included in the default experience for everybody. But yeah, generally speaking, it's mostly finding out what the things that the people already are saying we can include with our guidelines. and. Those meetings that you mentioned in person, we also do the same. We are remote, also like people from all over the world. And we get together and we have those maybe more difficult conversations in person because it's much easier to understand each other and to, you know, arrive to a conclusion. And then is when we actually make the biggest decisions of how to take the product in a different direction. Uh, because, yeah, online, everybody's very isolated and they only see their own needs. And in person, you can actually see like, okay, there is three different problems that we would be fixing by improving this feature in particular. And okay, let's uh, talk specifics. And one thing I wonder, Godot is known more for 2D, uh, 2D game engine. It's been very used for the indie uh, market and now it's growing in a 3D. Is the, for instance, the grow on 3D incidental or do you guys have a group dedicated to, okay, we do have in our roadmap we want to make sure this user group is targeted. And even though we're not hearing, it's a bit of the survivor bias, right? People that need a 3D engine might not be using Godot, so we're not gonna even be hearing about them. And then, so do you actually go to the effort of doing something less organic and more deliberately? Okay, we want also that audience. 
Yeah, no, we don't do things for people to start using that. We do very like MVP versions of features and then people keep improving it, especially the community. But in this case, Godot was started as a 3D engine and the people who was using it filled all their needs, right? And then when it got more popular, the people who started using it were indie developers, solo developers. And it's very unlikely that you are a good 3D modeler and that you are also a programmer and you can do everything by yourself. That's why we've seen like so many 2D games. That's why we saw a lot of feedback about the 2D aspects of it that were lacking and we improved the 2D aspects of it. So it got better and it got better. And now that they, we have more people that are more professionals jumping in, they are already used to their own workflows with 3D and then they start finding those uh, areas that are very lacking and that's why we're improving those areas now because more people that are with different needs are using the, the 3D areas of it. But uh, it's always this sort of evolving uh, software depending on, on the current users and what we try to do is to keep some, like the, the standards are not, like the, the barriers are not so difficult uh, like for instance, we don't want to bloat the engine, adding everything under the sun. There's other engines that you download and it includes absolutely everything. And that's something we want to keep always as small as possible, like a single binary, like that you can download in a very bad connection. You don't need online login to do anything like uh, basic. And uh, also the priority of this is software for making games. A lot of people now are using it for making programs and there are different needs for like how many times you refresh the screen, how many things like you do. Who makes that decision nowadays? Is the developer assigned to review the patch? It is the community. We have like two, are two different members, let's say. Like th we have some uh, people hired in the foundations, which are contractors that are working on mostly fixing bugs or doing the things that the community don't want to do. And then there's the members that are like, contributors that have been contributing for a long time and they know a little bit more or less how the engine works, what the things are and usually the features need to start in a proposal and in that proposal is where we kind of decide if that's wanted or not. Yeah, before who, who, is, who is the one deciding how does, if any of the core developers say it's good enough, it gets in? Not, more, not really. We have meetings about them? We do have meetings in particular areas and those are public for everybody to join if you want to talk about that rendering specific feature you can go into the meeting you discuss and sometimes we even reach out to studios that are using the, the software and we ask them what are their needs in this area like would this help them or not and we use those signals to say okay this is very needed but i think it's very evident like there isn't a lot of features that are like uh, I don't know if these people will like this or not. Usually you really see that people like something very, very much and you see videos, posts and everybody like asking for it. So it's very obvious that that's something we should work on. And if no collaborators, like no outside collaborators wants to do a PR, we have to assign some of our contractors to do it. I, I have a question you raised that I actually am curious about all three of you. Um, you mentioned voting and thumbs up as a way to kind of see what people are interested in. Does that ever backfire on you where like you see a feature that you really know is a bad idea and yet it's very popular? <laughs> yes, usually it's not really that it's a bad idea, but maybe it's a bad solution to the problem. So yeah, it's a lot of discussing like, we want to fix this, but maybe the proposed solution is not this one. Let's see which one is the best one for everybody. And yeah, that's that's a very difficult. And some of those topics are the ones that we discuss in person or we do more meetings about. Uh, but yeah, we don't have a lot of product minded people also. So and it's a lot of programmers with very strong opinions. I think the few times we did some voting, this is only on the Blender conference maybe, when asking show of hands. And the main backfire in that case is that there are so many things we want to build that we know it's needed but to actually build something requires sometimes a, the stars have to align a little bit. Developers have to be motivated. The agenda have to be free. People need to know that area enough or some areas need some refactoring before we get to work and there's no time. Um, on the, of course, in the topic of prioritization, we could always be prioritizing those things that people are being louder about. But we did some uh, empty promises in the past. I think we still we're so short of the depth compositing which we promised in the Blender conference 2019, I think. <laughs> <laughs>
So we don't, we really don't do voting as the only, the backfire is, we are excited about, you know, knowing what people want and is very careful not to over promise. Yeah, yeah, it's, the voting is just a signal among other signals to, to take into account in terms of like, this is wanted. And yeah, we never promise either, like what we are going to always be showing is a wish list of what we like to see, but not like this will come in the next feature because then, then people have you know, very, very high expectations. Yeah, about the voting, we don't do voting uh, either. Uh, although our um, support person, uh, this already told us that she, she would like to have voting. But um, <laughs> it is true that there are certain topics and there are certain requests that came up constantly. And we make the count. We make the count. We, we, we have uh, our, yeah, in internal documents, uh, yeah, we have all this information that help us to guide our decisions. And the thing is that I'm very interested in something that you mentioned before, which is that the, the fact that sometimes we are developing a product for a certain use case, for a certain user type, to do certain tasks, uh, but then around there are a lot of people, very valid people, that are trying to use your product in a different way and for different things. And they have their reasons, obviously. And they ask you very reasonable um, things to do. Um, in our case, for instance, uh, Pempot is meant for product teams that uh, develop uh, digital products and that usually have designers, interaction designers and developers. But we also have requests of people that want Pempot to do printing, good printing, for instance. Are we against printing? Okay, <laughs> probably not, probably not. But this is not in our product vision. So what do you guys do? in these situations because this this yeah these requests are, are reasonable uh, you at, at some point you would love to do that but as a product manager part of your job is to say no to things that you want to do because you know that it's not going to be um, it's not it's not going to help to the to the mission ambition of the company and the product and and then you have to take the decision of saying no and talk to, th to these people directly, uh, saying that you are not going to go through that path. And, and here I, I, I have something, which is also a question. Uh, I have some, something in mind related to something very specific, which is the ability that has uh, most of our products to, to have extensions, right? To have what, sorry? Extensions, extensions, oh, add-ons, plugins, plugins etc. We at Pempot are about to launch our plugin system. It will happen maybe today. <laughs> <laughs> Cross my fingers, yeah, pray for me. <laughs> and it is a, a brand new uh, plugin system. And this setup set up a whole new landscape for us. And, and this should allow us to, to, to ask ourselves if something that the community is requesting should be done by, by ourselves and added to the core, or if we should uh, encourage, foster, that the community build up, build this as a plugin. And I know that probably you both at Blender and Godot already have this problem for a long time. So I, I, I would love to, to, to know mean, about uh, your experience with that. Maybe a show of hands, who here has used, realized on add-ons to their, do their professional work, which is not provided a core of the Blender experience, more than half of the room. If you ask for the room of artists and the other nice artist talks, you're gonna see <laughs> way more show of hands. <laughs> um, definitely the add-on ecosystem allowed us to make sure that the core of the experience provided by Blender is uh, well thought of uh, solutions and that are applicable to a lot of uh, use cases. Because sometimes you have a very specific niche that you know your solution doesn't make sense, shouldn't be bloating, bloating the blender which is available for everyone. Um, it's a to add it sword because that also made first that also like a lot of the talent in terms of design and solution went to this market. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about market, but I'm also talking about can be open source uh, add-ons, of course. 
just, as you said, until recently, there was not even a big hub for people to go and share their uh, only uh, open source and GPL. All the add-ons are open source and GPL, but have a nice hub, as we now do with the extensions platform in Blender. But all in all, like on one hand, we see a lot of people that could be contributing to the core of Blender hmm. are actually putting all their design and energy on s solving that those one-off problems and like, hey, why not? Why don't you try to think about this in a way that could be into Blender? Of course, we know that doing something in Python is more approachable, mm -hmm. but could have been in Python and at the core of Blender. That's not a prob problem. The other problem is that a lot of the urging needs of parts of the community are already addressed by add-ons. <coughs> we know that uh, physics simulation is uh, in Blender has been lagging for a couple of years. We are working on that year by year as part of the jump to nodes roadmap. But we also know that it's not, we don't have anyone knocking on our door about that because people that really need and can afford, they have places to go where they can buy some, whatever, third party solution for fluid simulation or baking or UVs. So it's, in a way, you open a, a gate that you have no control over, which is beautiful. People you know, creating, being create, creative and developing solutions. But uh, we are trying now with the Blender, with the extensions platform, for instance, try to bring this closer to the Blender uh, ecosystem. So to answer you, yeah, I don't know if that uh, <laughs> covered yeah. much. Yeah. I wanted to say like in t like some features like what you mentioned like I want to do print uh, kind of things with them but we do get those and usually it's like we know it's something really cool but then we need to ask do we have someone that could maintain it in the future because as soon as we merge it then we need to be taken care of like uh, indefinitely sometimes we have a lot of like drive-by contributions somebody comes sends a fix and disappear and you know into the sand you never see them again some other times you have someone that's trusted that's been there for a long time and they want to take care of that area and they can actually keep up with that. So if it really fits and it's not bloating the engine, like it's not only for a niche of people and it's not something you can do in an extension, then we value like, can we take care of this moving on? And if we can and we, we go through all this, then we include it in the, the core experience. But we, it's very difficult to find those things. That's why we invested a lot in the extension side of things. Interestingly, we actually have a, kind of a policy of trying to avoid plug-in architectures um, because of that loss of control. Just which... to be clear, Blender also has a very strict design against <laughs> binary plugins. Mm -hmm. So, but maybe it's a double standard when it comes to Python plugins and binary uh, add-ons or and the idea that it's still the core offering of Blender should be enough to make everyone happy and not depend on extensions. Yeah, it's it's a matter of constant internal debates because almost everybody. I mean, the the alternative to plugins is when someone asks for something and especially when they're willing to contribute it, then you're either saying no, that's not in the vision of the product, go away, which is very difficult to do. Um, or you're saying, yes, we will take that onto our roadmap. We will put in the efforts and we will give up on doing something else because it's important, which is also difficult to do. Or the hardest thing to do is to say, yes, and we will work with you to help do that and to like engage them and effectively bring them in as a member of the product team in a way. Um, I mean, I'm talking obviously about big features, but like that all three of those paths are really challenging. And so internally, we have a lot of pressure for, can we just tell them that they can develop it as a, as a plugin? And our escape valve for that is to say, like, you have to be very careful. I think everyone here knows you get, you, the, um, the, the trite answer of, well, you can always fork it. Like, you can always, you can always do that. Um, for some of our products, especially Ubuntu, we try to give that as like a nice answer for really big people who want to do something like print design um, when you're trying to develop a different type of tool we say well what you want is a flavor and then we actually have an entire kind of product management regime around helping the flavors and helping them be downstream from so what you we do, do have people in the core team in the payroll helping to maintain those forks, not to maintain those forks, but giving guidance. And and even sometimes to help maintain them. And we include them like when there's a big security update that we're going to roll out to, to the main Ubuntu, we will reach out to those flavors and involve them in the process, even under NDA, because, you know, once the security 
<clears throat> once a CVE goes live, it's too late. Um, and so we will work with them and make sure that everything is secure. And so we all release on the same day. I, I was wondering, do you want me to talk? <laughs> no, no. I was thinking, we have 10 minutes, so we can start thinking about. There was not one thing I wanted to get away from that, but I know we have one person itching to ask something. I hear you guys talk. You often talk about design and product as if this is a little bit in the same area. But when I was thinking of this, I thought it were basically three things. We have engineering, uh, they care about the technology. We have design, they care about using and create and bringing the users to the technology. And you have product, which is a separate quality. Is that for you the same or is for you product management and design a little bit in the same department. Well, I don't serve Andy who is... Yeah, that's, uh, a, that, that's a great question. That's a, how, how do you categorize and then classify? Because you are head of product nowadays and you, yeah. your background is in Bellas Artes. Yeah, yeah, fine arts. Fine arts. Fine arts. Yes. And you went into design and do you make a... Do you separate your design capacity from your product? Yeah. So uh, it's hard to do that, yeah, and I strongly bias it because like Dalai said, um, I have a background in, in art and design and I started in the project as a user experience designer and our product, our product it's, um, I, I could say that our product is very, very design centric. So merging the, 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 the field of user experience with the field of product management felt like natural something natural but but i well aware that uh, those are not the same things those are not the same things um however if i think about the like the um the three main legs of this table which is uh, your product i think usually on technology like you said on product and then in product i include uh, um, I include design and the product in the product vision and then business. Like uh, uh, we need to know in, in business could, could, mean, could, could mean many things, not only making money, right? But how are we going to make this sustainable? How are we going to build an economy around this? And these kind of things. And the role of product manager, in my opinion, um, has to be balanced between this business and this uh, design part, this user part. Uh, but like I said, I'm strongly biased because of my background. Oh, I, I'm sh I share your bias. Um, <laughs> that, uh, that triangle, I think, is very common that you describe um, in most of the places I've been. But in Canonical, it's almost more like a circle because we have kind of equal peers with building documentation, multiple types of engineering that are concerned with just security or just performance, et cetera. Um, of course, design and product, but also marketing. And so there's like so many different roles that, contrib that contribute to product leadership that it looks more like a circle. And then the individuals that lead for a given product can take up some sort of different part of that arc. And so but uh, is this part of the microphone for the recording? Is yeah. the product part of the marketing or the design department? Um, or its own department? No, we have a product is its own department and the department head is the CEO. And marketing is its own department, design is its own department. Yes. Yeah, and for us, we don't have that delimitation at all, like between designers, programmers, product, like it's mostly the people that want to take that task and they are doing it, the ones who are carrying the burden of the product design or design or the programming. And that's something, I, as I said at the beginning, it's because of how we grew, especially coming all from programmers from GitHub, like mostly people who are making games are also contributing the code and all that. And um, we do need to do better into including different sorts of profiles in, in the community because right now it's very underrepresented. So it's all in the same bag kind of thing.
But as, for Godot, it's also a semantic difference because you also have no designers in the team, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. whether it's together with the product or not, also. I, I, yeah. should, I should qualify what I said a little bit, which is we actually have a VP of product who is the department head. Um, the CEO, though, like when he puts his, like, his thumb into the organization to try to influence a product, it's through the product organization, which just goes to show like how important that is as a, a path to influence. So even though it's just a part of the circle, it's kind of like the most important part of the circle. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like in, when I was working on other kind of things before, like product in a startup, let's say it's very powerful and they are kind of driving the, the other teams. That's how I always felt it. But in open source, I feel, especially if it's community driven, it's very hard to tell people what to do and tell them like, this is what we should be working on. It's like, okay, good luck, you do it. So it's hard and you need that kind of figure that can actually lead the people and convince them that this is a good idea. So it kind of defeats the, the purpose to have someone in that position if nobody's going to be hearing them. Yeah. No wonder the role is dying maybe in the industry. <laughs> yeah. I think in Blender, my memories is on the Blender 2.5 project. And at that time, uh, even before, I think for Elephant Stream, there was a, a clear call for help in very specific areas. So Blender, as most of us know, relies a lot on the Blender Animation Studio to be driving a lot of the demands and to be representative of uh, the agenda and the roadmap. Uh, the problem we are facing now, I would say, is that there are a lot of use cases that there's no way we can do it in-house. For instance, the automotive industry is somehow like just got wind of Blender, just using Blender like from end to end. And like a lot of them, not only one, we've seen at least four vendors already uh, with Blender in their pipeline. And as much as we, you know, people drive cars, not in the Netherlands so much. But <laughs> <laughs> so we know how a car is, but it's different, right? They, they, they use nerves and they have a different pipeline. So we're trying now a little bit more to see, okay, for architectures. We have a SIG for architects, by the way, tomorrow, I think, come by. Let's see, is there needs specific from the architecture industry which are already being served or that we can help them to self-organize to maybe here and there to improve? Because there's the user base for Blender which is mostly animation, it's been four years. But for instance, the 2D animation Tom mentioned on his talk is what has the main feature films that's being made with Blender is thanks to Chris Pencil. And that whole era of Blender is started as a community contribution. There's a little group based in Spain with community. They are ready from the community, but also they were just welcomed into Blender, into the development process, and had a lot of autonomy to just be talking to the studios, to the user base. And nowadays, this year in particular, we managed to have developers hired in the team to work in that area to m help make sure it's more integrated, whatnot. But for years, it was a fully independent community effort at the core of the Blender experience. And that, you know, that part worked. But how many of those other segments are in a dire need of attention that maybe could help a little bit? Not help in the sense of foxer development there, but maybe help them to self-organize and maybe hire developers themselves because they know their need, but they are the ones that could have a product manager and developer uh, working together. So for us, a little bit the, the challenging in the upcoming cycles. Yeah, you know, what you mentioned of the automotive industry, like kind of the same happens with Godot as well. Like we've seen more people using it in different places, even in the automotive industry. And that's why we have these pillars of this is a game engine to make games. Like the rest is secondary because if not, you know, you have to accommodate these other use cases that, you know, it's going to get out of scope. Uh, so those are the only places where we can actually say maybe not try to use an extension, make a fork, do whatever you need to. And that's what most of them do. Uh, that's the nice thing. You can fork it, do whatever you want with that version of it, that, uh, especially if they need some special, uh, uh, how is it called, like uh, legal, uh, yeah, I, I don't have the word now, but you know, you got to go through a legal process to get that code into a car or something like that. They can do it on their own as if it was their, co their code, not our software running there. And, and that's it. Uh, but you always need to remember like what your target audience is and our description is like that like game developers like everything else is secondary are the 3d artists part of the core audience of godot 
No, 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 no. Like we don't do any. Like that's why. Like we, the better we can implement it with Blender, it's better that people can use the software that's meant to do Blend. Because we saw some plugins to make models inside Godot. It's like uh, okay, nice, but maybe it's you know not gonna be ever as good as using a software that's specifically for that. And uh, it will also add a lot of complexity that we cannot maintain. So. The same as why we don't have a, a image editor inside of the the game engine. With other engines, do have Game Maker has a very good uh, image editor inside of the engine, and uh, you know they have to keep maintaining that. But I feel like it's going out of the scope of you know you can use other tools that are very specialized and you can import it and do the game. Okay, okay. Uh, to wrap up because it's the turn of the hour. Yeah, I'm using his clock throughout. The <laughs> <laughs> Um, just say it's obvious. Thanks so much for being here. They're going to be here most of the days. Hans, maybe only today. If you want to stay longer, we can talk. But there's a canonical summit happening in The Hague this week. So very lucky to be able to grab him for one day. There's plenty of conversation to be had, especially, I guess, for the developers or stakeholders, power users that have you know, dire needs. Please reach out to them. Please reach out to the Blender developers as well. Um, if you have any closing thoughts you'd like to share, Andy? The mic is yours. <laughs> oh, thank you, Eli. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, just one thing. Um, I just wanted to, uh, I just didn't want to finish the talk without mentioning the fact that here in the audience, uh, here in this, in this stage, we are four, four men, right? Which automatically make, makes this um, an all my panel. And it's not the ideal situation, right? I think we, we all agree with, with that. And I know also the reasons why it happened. I know that this happened because uh, a, a last minute issue that, uh, yeah, unfortunate and that happened. But yeah, just didn't, in my opinion, in not, only, not only in my opinion, in our company, in Kaleidos and, and in Pempot, uh, we are kind of activists with this thing of um, uh, inclusivity and diversity and, and inclusivity and, and, and and diversity, I'm sorry. And yeah, just wanted to mention this because uh, even with the best intention, sometimes uh, we can have situations like this. So, yeah, the line. We, we talked about that, and it's yeah. for me it relates also in the sense that we're talking about bringing design to the process of development, bringing you know product, bringing different talents, and for that, we want to make sure people see, can be seen as belonging, and that's is a known thing here. Anna couldn't join us. Good addition. I hope next time yeah. he's going to be here. Yeah, we all have to uh, work to do with that. Good luck with the you. extensions launch. You already, you already tested, right? I tested. We are using, <laughs> so we are using, we use Penpot for some of the mockups and wireframes to do at Blender because being open source, anyone can have it. We might self host at some point. And we actually use the new plugin system to port all the 720 icons we have in the Blender to the to Penpot because it's, yeah, how else? So, like, uh, it's working well. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Valai, for bringing me the no. opportunity to bring up the topic and for testing the plugins. No. <laughs> Always. Uh, the one thing I wanted to add to our discussion um, dovetails to that, which is product management in open source specifically has a heavy community management aspect to it that people coming from more commercial contexts are often not ready for. Um, and so, it, if anything, I'd almost choose someone who's a strong community manager and then help them learn to be a product leader or a designer than the other way around when you're in an open context like this. And a major part of community management is kind of ensuring that you have a heterogeneous, diverse set of people and trying to be inclusive. And that means putting forward the, a face of the company that's welcoming to people. Very, very good point. I think at Blender, we, we're still not there in terms of product management being higher. Mm -hmm. We do look at try to train people from within. And there, I've seen, I think some engineers are taking that naturally after being involved and understanding, think about use cases, thinking about make sure the deliverables are always are ready, something tangible. For jump to nodes, we had a talk two years ago, I think, or last year, about the whole development process. We mentioned that a lot, about how we made the effort to have demo files right from the beginning. And um, But we're also trying to get maybe stakeholders to 
bringing, we have a few people, so we have artists involved in the modules. So a lot of any module, uh, most of the module have meetings and people are welcome to join. And people that have the time and can help testing it, can help giving feedback, there are a few of them in the audience here. They are naturally also candidates to start, stop looking at their own problem and look at the problem of Blender as a whole. That's the only, only mind shift that they have to do. And they also are pretty good candidates to, to tackle that because they're already representative of the, of the community. Yeah, I wanted to add if any member of the audience here or online, like if they are interested in this and they want to contribute, like we're always ready to listen and to welcome new people. Like I know it's very scary and it's full of programmers and you know a lot of ugly platforms that you have to use to communicate. But you know, at the end of the day, the people are very welcoming and that's how I got started. I wanted to help with some things that I kind of didn't like so much and I didn't find a very strong opposition and I feel like this welcoming environment is what we want to keep having in the future. So, you know, to either product, I guess, uh, if you want to reach out, most people don't know that they can participate. They can join the meetings that are public. They can start talking with people. It's not like you need to do an online application to, to have a conversation or anything. So getting involved is, is really valuable for, for everyone. Thanks so much. I think that's the takeaway I'll take as well, that while the projects are trying to reach out to the use bases, there's also always an open channel for people representing right, strong use cases that can behave well online and have some time available. Really, it's been happening in the past, it's happening in the present, it's how we build Blender. So I, I know that the more the Blender grows, more people might feel dis distan distanced from it, but should be we hope it's quite the opposite. We hope being here, people can feel that we're just you know, people that believe in something. Most of the developers, probably 99 of the developers and designers involved in Blender are people that started using Blender and then they have the same memory of the first time they open Blender and they meet the Blender developers. So I think it's a, it's a good takeaway to try to close that bridge between the developers and the people that can be stakeholders and product people. Um, thanks so much, you three, for being here. Thanks so much for your time, and I hope you all have a great conference. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.